Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Oh, come on. One more time. How's everybody doing? There we go. Excellent. I'm Jeff Woolsey. I'm a principal program manager in the cloud and enterprise division at Microsoft. It's truly a pleasure to be here. Just want to thank everybody at Cisco. It's really awesome to be here at Cisco Live. Uh, we've been doing a whole bunch of development together, a lot of type of development together around cloud solutions. We're going to talk about that. But one of the interesting things also was Cisco said, look, we'd also like you to talk about where you guys are going today in terms of application development. How do I write, what's my application development look like today? And where is it going in the future? So kind of give people a glimpse of where we're going together. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, one of the things I always like to generally start off, though, is kind of talk, talk and explain very quickly and simply how we think about the cloud at Microsoft. Because depending on who you talk to, you may get a different answer about, about how cloud, how, what a cloud looks like. And at Microsoft, the cloud is really simple. We think of it as really three legs to a stool, okay? And it starts with the private cloud. And the private cloud for, for Microsoft is Windows Server and System Center. And I always bring up both Windows Server and System Center because generally, I've been at Microsoft now for over 12 years, and people talk to me and they say, hey Jeff, from a platform standpoint, I'm using Windows Server, or I'm using Hyper-V, or I'm using VMware, or I'm using Insert Hypervisor here. And I say, great. That's fantastic. Tell me about your systems management solution, though. How are you managing your resources? How are you managing your applications, your storage, your networking, your compute? And the room generally gets very quiet. And one of the biggest gaps I've seen is that people haven't been investing the way they should in terms of systems management, application management, operating systems, and more. So System Center is about managing all of those things. Well. Again, when I talk about the private cloud, I can describe the private cloud in one word, and that word is control, okay? I will talk with customers all the time from literally around the world, and I've talked to customers that said, Jeff, I have a workload that has to run in a German data center on German soil by a German citizen. Are you gonna try and force me up to Azure? Or are you gonna try and make me do something unnatural? And the answer is absolutely not. This is not an engineering discussion at all. In fact, this is not a technical discussion. It's about how you want to run your business. If that's the case, then let's help you build the best private cloud together. And this is work we've been doing very closely with our partners at Cisco around ACI. Today with Windows Server and System Center, we've been doing a tremendous amount of integration, making sure that Windows Server, System Center, and I'll get to the Azure Pack in a moment, but all of these integrate from a resource provider standpoint to pr pr provide you an excellent on-premises private cloud solution. At the same time, we've also been making huge investments in our public cloud. In our public cloud, Azure. That's Office 365, that's infrastructure as a service, that's platform as a service, it's software as a service. It's all of the above. And if I was to describe the public cloud in one word, that word is scale. In Azure, we can run literally applications that span the entire globe. Anybody watch the Sochi Olympics last year, 2014 Sochi Olympics, yeah? If you watched any of the Olympics, that was all delivered on Azure. We streamed to over 22 countries, four continents around the world, all done on Azure. If you watched, for example, the USA-Canada hockey match, we actually set a world record. We had over two million people logging in and watching it live, streaming around the world. How many of those were powered by Cisco switches, Cisco networks? I'm guessing a huge percentage of those. But it shows you the power and scale that we can deliver from our public cloud. Then finally, we have service providers. And service providers give us customization and reach. Because we know, for example, there are locations, there are countries where we don't have a local Azure presence. And in times, many times, customers will say, Jeff, I need a customized SLA. And sometimes I've, I've had people ask me in Azure, can I take a specific workload and put it in a specific server, in a specific rack, in a specific data center in Azure? But unfortunately, my answer is no. Because in Azure, we don't deal at scale like that. We buy servers in lots of thousands at a time. We don't even think about a rack. A rack is far too small. So if someone needs that level of customization or that type of SLA, we've got service providers around the world that can do that. And a great way to do that is taking advantage of the Azure pack and the integration we've been doing with Cisco. Well, the key to this Microsoft Cloud is really simple. When we talk about the cloud, it's all three of these. It's not one, it's not two, it's all three every single time. And in fact, what people are looking for 
is a consistent platform across all three of those. And in fact, when I ask customers, where is it you want to be in three years, in five years, in 10 years? I always get that question asked of me, Jeff, are we going to be all public in five years? Are we going to be all private in five years or 10 years? And my answer is always yes. The answer is going to be all of the above. Yes, there's still going to be some that are only public cloud. There are going to be some that are only private cloud. The vast majority of customers we're talking to are all hybrid. It's all in the middle. They, want, they tell me, Jeff, I want to take advantage of the fact that Azure has, oh my gosh, massive scale. Or I can get super awesome storage. I can get gigabytes of storage for a fraction of a penny. That's the kind of storage I'm looking for. But at the same time, there may be workloads that I want to run in my private cloud or that can't move to the public cloud because it's some legacy application. So I'm still going to have a private cloud. And it means that hybrid connectivity is super important to me. And that's where we're making huge investments with Cisco to make sure that we have that great hybrid connectivity, that ACI plugs in from an application standpoint to make sure that our applications work best in these environments with dynamic changing networks underneath them. But it's right, quite simply, we look at the cloud as all three of these. And it's very different than some of the others. For example, AWS, their answer to cloud is, there's only one, there's only the AWS cloud. You want to run anything on premises? They don't care. For us, it's all three. And I'm not going to try and force you to any one of those. You determine what makes business sense for you. Now, one of the hottest downloads over the last 18 months has been the Windows Azure Pack. So from a consistency standpoint, one of the things we did was we literally took the Azure portal and we gave it to you. We said, here you go, free, co free code. The Azure Pack is literally the Azure portal that we've made freely available. It plugs in the system center, plugs in the Windows server so that you can deliver and create your own on-premises private cloud. It has a tenant and experience. It has a cloud admin experience. And guess what? We've been working really closely with Cisco from an ACI perspective. They've delivered an ACI resource provider that plugs right into Azure Pack. It's really super cool. What this means is your folks can use on-premises private cloud that looks just like Azure. We also have service providers around the world that are providing service provider offerings using the Azure Pack. So it looks just like Azure. So it's a, it's a great consistency story. Now, of course, to support this vision, we've got to make sure that from a development standpoint, you can do everything you need to. John's going to come up here in just a minute to talk more about the dev story. But from us, that means Visual Studio means I can write an application and deploy it anywhere. Whatever framework, whatever application, we want to make sure it just works. From a management standpoint, System Center, System Center, and we've made huge investments in Intune and systems management up in our public cloud. From a data perspective, SQL Server, SQL Server, and of course, SQL Server runs in Azure, both as infrastructure as a service, as well as platform as a service. Identity, Active Directory, Active Directory as the canonical way to do identity, authentication, security, and authorization, as well as Azure Active Directory in our public cloud. And in fact, Azure Active Directory, we knew it was going to be popular. We had no idea just how popular it was going to be. We released it last year, and we average over 18 billion authentications a week. Not a month, not a six months, every single week. So we're on a rate to do over a trillion authentications a year. And that's how popular Azure Active Directory has been. And then finally, from a virtualization standpoint, Hyper-V powers all of this. And let me be super clear. Hyper-V powers one of the two largest clouds in the world, and that's Azure. And it has since day one. This is all powered, and let's be clear, Azure, what is Azure? It's Windows Server. Now, we don't call it Windows Server in the cloud because it's a finished service. We actually give you, we don't give you bits and say, go install it, no, no. It's actually Windows Server in the cloud, and that's running on Hyper-V. And so for us, quite simply, when we talk about cloud, our goal is real simple. It's to provide you the best cloud whenever and wherever that makes business sense. And that's something that Cisco and, and Microsoft have a deep understanding and a deep strategic investment on that. We believe that absolutely. Whether you want to run it on your premises, in the public cloud, in a service provider, or mix and match any of those, or more importantly, move workloads. Today, maybe you're here in the private cloud. Maybe next year you say, you know what, I'd like to move portions of my application up to the public cloud to a service provider or back. How do you think you're going to do that without your network and your fabric management working closely together? Spoiler alert, they won't unless they're closely working together. 
In the last 18 months, by the way, just to give you a quick example of some of the things we've done, this is just in Azure. This is just a high level view of some of the features that we've delivered. Um, this isn't a full list by any stretch of the imagination, but it shows you that in Azure, we're working at cloud speed. We could actually deliver features every single week if we wanted to, in many cases, every single day. Um, what we generally do is we package up um, features <coughs> And we'll package those up together and deliver those maybe monthly or quarterly. Because otherwise, we could deliver features that would be too difficult for people to consume because we're delivering new features so fast. But what's amazing is this cloud cadence allows us to do things up in Azure. We take those features and then we put those into Windows Server. We also deliver new features into Windows Server, which get delivered into Windows and into Microsoft Azure as well. So there's a huge amount of, of, of virtuous engineering going on there. So, Last thing I'm going to point out uh, in Azure before I bring up John is just our footprint because I get asked about this all the time. Jeff, kind of where do you guys fit, you know, between basically, you know, it's you and AWS and that's pretty much that's what the case is. It's AWS and us. Google's kind of third place somewhere in there. Um, but basically, if you look at our data center footprint, we have 19 regions worldwide as of 2014. And one thing I want to point out, a region is not a data center. A region consists of multiple data centers because we have to have failover in each region. So when you see 19 regions, don't equate that with a data center. Each region has multiple data centers. The other thing to point out is when we talk about data centers, a data center for us is something pretty huge. It means it's going to hold probably a couple of jumbo Airbus A330s, something huge. And I bring this up because some of our folks talk about their data centers, but their data centers are like the size of the stage. This is not a data center. This is like my living room, okay? Data center is something huge. So this is just an idea of where we are in terms of Azure footprint. This is ballpark uh, about 2x AWS and over 3x Google, in case you guys were wondering. So in terms of Azure, that kind of sets you up. Let's, let's get to the application development model. And one of the areas we've been focused on is making sure we've got the best open platform. And for that, I want to invite John Galloway up here to talk about open platform developers. John? All right. Am I on? Good? Yep, OK. So I'm going to take just a quick overview here to look at the, the platform that Microsoft's building for developers. And I just want to kind of emphasize the point that Jeff's been talking about, that we are really building a platform for you so you can use the language of your choice, the tools of your choice, you can mix and match. So you don't have to make hard choices of, OK, we're just going to use the cloud and we're just going to use your stuff. You can mix and match and use what makes sense to you. So one of the things I wanted to point out here is Visual Studio Code. Has anyone here downloaded or used Visual Studio Code? Have you heard about it? Anyone else heard about it? OK, so this, uh, we just announced this at the Build Conference uh, a month or so ago. Um, Visual Studio Code is a cross-platform code editor. So this is a free download, works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, sometimes when I say that, people get so shocked they don't hear that I said Windows in there. It's actually a great code editor on Windows as well. Um, and what it, what's nice about it is compared to some other kind of lightweight code editors you'll find, is it actually understands your code. So it can compile, it can debug, it can uh, give you kind of a, a rich editing experience that you won't find if you're just using a text editor that does some kind of simple autocomplete. Um, so another thing, that's it, advance. Oh, <laughs> can we switch back actually to the slide machine here? There we go, okay, great. So. Um, so I want to talk about app service. Um, app service is something that we announced, uh, which is an offering for hosting your entire, uh, hosting different parts of an application that need to work together. Now, uh, in Azure, there's the, uh, we noticed a lot of people were, you know, hosting websites using our platform as a service offering. So that's very simple. You could think of it as, it's as easy as shared hosting, but it gives you scale and power and a lot of features you can plug in as you want them. But then we saw people were doing a lot of other things too. People were building uh, mobile applications and backing those mobile applications with APIs uh, and, host and using websites because it's such an easy platform to use. Um, and then we also noticed that people needed to create long-running, durable uh, API management systems. So they needed to 
uh, call out to other other uh, APIs, maybe you know Salesforce or Dynamics or Twilio or all kinds of different APIs, and they were writing their own custom code and they had to ensure that they were handling retry logic and making sure that the, the thing kept pulling on a regular basis and handled failures gracefully. And so what we did was we actually came up with a system here. This is app service and it provides all those things in one package for you so that all those things can work together for you. One other thing that we did as part of that, you know, we want to make sure it's an open platform that's going to work across things that you use is you can actually write your own custom code as API apps and plug into that as well. So in app service, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it works great across the language of your choice. So of course we support .NET code, but it also works well with uh, Node.js, Python, PHP. Uh, I talked recently to somebody who was launching their uh, startup and they were doing it using app service and on Python and they were so excited about it. Um, Another thing that's great about this, and this is kind of where you get to the, you know, it's a level above what you would find in, in something like shared hosting, is that uh, you can hook up continuous integration. So what that means is you can point your uh, app service at your repository. It could be, you know, it could be running on Visual Studio Online, it could be running on uh, GitHub, it could be your own custom Git repository, and it'll actually check the code out build it, run your tests, and each time you make a commit, it can you know, do that build and test step and then deploy it. it. You can have it deploy out to an integration or a test server or even uh, directly to a production server. Um, so that gives you a lot of, you know, your team can quickly see how things are integrating as they're working and building the code. Um, another great feature here is auto scale, and what that allows you to do is as you uh, you know, as you get more load, it can automatically scale that up for you. So you're not having to make this tough decision of, do I only want to pay for one instance and have an outage, or do I have multiple instances and, you know, pay too much? Well, this will manage that for you. So it's scaling up and down as the load comes in. And, you know, a lot of the time people think about scaling up. But scaling down is just as important because you don't want to have to invest in a lot of infrastructure and not use it a lot of the time, right? Um, so this is big, the enterprise connectivity. And Jeff pointed this out earlier. You know, it's, it's always going to be hybrid, hybrid solutions. You're not going to be, you know, we understand that you've got data that you need to keep in-house or want to keep in-house. You have services that your company's built and is running in-house. Um, but you can still leverage the cloud. You can, you can deploy applications to Azure and you can hook up a virtual network that can call back in. So, you know, the uh, Dynamics, SQL, SAP, Oracle, your network here, right? So you can plug in anything you need to. As, as an example of how like, well this has worked for me, I actually uh, was working on a demonstration and I needed to call back into SQL Server running on my laptop and I was in a hotel. And you know how bad hotel Wi-Fi can be, right? They do crazy things. I don't understand how bad they can mess it up. And I, you know, I got it working really quick and I was like, this is too easy. I can't believe I'm running, you know, Azure website up in the cloud, connecting to SQL Server running on my laptop through whatever crazy Wi-Fi things they do on the hotel networks. And then I mentioned uh, uh, Logic Apps, that's part of this app service, and this is that managed system where you can plug in and you can say, you know, I'm writing my application, it's my own website, but I want to take advantage of, you know, I want to call into Salesforce and get a list of my customers. Or when an order completes, I want to send a text message using Twilio or something like that. So this is as easy as just, you know, adding the service. You can build a workflow, so it'll say first ping SQL Server, then every time there's a new change, uh, you know, connect to Salesforce, get more information, then call my own custom API, and that they just plug together and you just fill in the blanks for your, to connect the services. Okay, so I jumped ahead to this a little bit earlier, but uh, cross-platform, uh, this Visual Studio Code offering is, is actually really exciting for me. And the way it fits together, uh, how many people here use Visual, Stu or Visual Studio, the full Visual Studio? Okay. And uh, out of those people, who here is using Visual Studio 2015 yet? Okay, I love Visual Studio 2015. Um, and it's a complete 
IDE. It's a de developer, it's an integrated developer environment, and that means it's got all kinds of things. It's got, um, you know, rich debuggers and visualizers and designers and things. So that's, that's a full-featured uh, IDE. Visual Studio Code is a code optimized editor. So it specifically fits in to the, the area where you want to just get in and edit text. And that's, of course, C Sharp, but it's also uh, it's a great um, HTML, JavaScript, um, you know, your language here. It supports, I, I believe, uh, 45 to 50 languages now. Um, so you can download that from code.visualstudio.com. And, and so, you know, the place that that fits in is some people are using editors because they want some lightweight, fast to start up, get in, make, make a code change, and they're done. Um, an IDE does a lot more in terms of understanding your code, but it's a bigger, you know, it's a, a bigger thing and it, of course only works on Windows. And so Visual Studio Code kind of fits in at that sweet spot of it's better than an editor, um, but it, you can run it anywhere and it's incredibly fast to install and, and use. Um, I'll skip ahead here so I can actually demo some stuff. So can we switch over to my Mac here? Okay, so uh, code.visualstudio.com is where you install it. I literally, a few minutes before, I broke all the rules here, I, I actually installed the latest version of this sitting in the back here right before the talk, and it downloaded in you know a few seconds. It's really fast. Um, okay, uh, so here's an example. I've, I've got an application here. This is an app service. Let me span this over here. Okay, so this is an example of an API that, I, that I've plugged into Azure App Service. Um, if, you, if you've done uh, ASP.NET Web API or MVC, this will look pretty familiar to you. Um, so the nice thing about this is this actually it understands your code. So I can do things like I can click on this and find references to where something is used in the code. Right? I can also go in and I can use things like snippets. So I can go in and I can say, if I would like a for loop, I can go in and say something like, you know, for, and move down to it and say tab, tab, and it'll insert that for loop for me. And then it also, because it understands my code, I can, if I type something like this, then it's actually giving me IntelliSense and it's understanding everything that's in scope for my code, right? So, so, uh, a lot more than just editing text and trying to guess things, it actually has compiled it. And then because it also has, um, it's got integration with Git, so I can go in and as I make changes, if I, if I have it in a Git repository, I can double click on a file and it'll show me the changes. I can commit them from right there. And then we're working on debugging support. So this is actually, you can set a breakpoint in your code and go through and you know, understand like what is actually happening in your code. So that's Visual Studio Code. I wanted to also show you, uh, we were talking about Azure, and I wanted to show um, the uh, cross-platform CLI tools. So this is, you know, of course you can, in Visual Studio, you can go, you can right-click, create website, and all that kind of stuff. But I can actually, on a Mac, I can go through and create a site. So here I've gone, I've just created a sim simple Angular node site, and I'm gonna go and blow that up a bit more. So I could say um, Azure Site Create, um, and I'll give this a name, you know, Cisco, uh, you know, 777, and I'll say dash dash get. So what that's gonna do is it's actually, it's going to first prompt me and it'll say, um, what region do you want to install this in? As Jeff mentioned earlier, we've, there's 19 data centers uh, available as of 2014, so here I'm gonna go in, I'm, I'm picking eight, which is West US. So then it's gonna go and create that site for me, and because I did that dash dash git at the end, it actually initializes the git, uh, a local git endpoint, so I can say uh, git push, and I can push to that Azure endpoint. Okay, so this is, this is really cool to see. This is actually on the fly right now provisioning that site for me, right? It's creating a site, this is a live site, and it's hooking it up so I can publish my application to it, okay? Um, so I'll set in a username. Okay, great. 
So now I'm going to, it's, it's created, a, a get, it's initialized to get repo for me. So I'll say uh, git add dot, and then I'll say git commit initial. Get dash m. Okay, so it's added all those. Then I can say get push. And what I like to point out too every time I'm typing, some people love doing things from the command line, right? But I, I don't always. I, I like you know having a, an IDE and like I pointed out Visual Studio Code. But an important thing, whenever you see something that's done from the command line, it means it could be scripted. So always think of that. That's an important feature. So here I'll put in my password. Oh no. <laughs> Try that again. Uh, excellent. Okay. So now I can say Azure Site Browse as soon as that completes. So what it's doing is it's packaging that code up, pushing it up, and again, this whole Git infrastructure that, that, that um, I'm showing here, this is the same kind of thing that, that could be um, hooked up with continuous integration as well. So now I can say Azure Site So then it's going to you know, spin up. So there's that site. So you just saw me. I, I took a random uh, Angular site. I did no extra work to you know, cloud enable it or anything. And I, and I just typed a few commands, created a site, and published it using Git Publishing. Okay. And um, then because it's built on Azure, I can do all those things that I pointed out earlier. Like I could hook in Logic Apps, or I could auto scale it, or I could turn on all these advanced features. right? So um, that's, I'm about out of time here. I just really wanted to point out, I guess we'll flip back over to this machine. And I just wanted to point out, you know, what an open platform we've got. Excellent. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. So that's what, that's where we are. There's, there's a number of things you saw there, the ability to use Windows, use Mac. I love the fact that he's up here doing a demo in Cisco Live on a Mac to Azure. That's pretty cool. Um, all that work that we've been doing across the industry, partnering very closely, coming to fruition in a very, very big way. Now, one of the things I wanted to do, kind of talk now, is kind of provide a forward-looking bent. Kind of where are we going? All of the stuff you've seen up to now is stuff that's shipping. 2012 R2, System Center 2012, Windows Server, Azure, Azure Pack, that's stuff that's all shipping and has been available now for over the last year. Where are we going in the next release and what's kind of driving our decisions as we develop for the cloud moving ahead? <clears throat> 2012 R2, that wave was designed with Azure as a design point. As we move to Windows Server to System Center 2016, we're now looking at cloud-first innovation and we're really focused on two key areas, both the core infrastructure as well as from an application platform. So, let me talk a little bit about how we think about this. And one of the things that we are very much, as I mentioned earlier on with the cloud OS and how we think about you know, all three clouds as being our cloud strategy, whether it's public, private, or service providers, we think about really our cloud is your edge and your server is our edge. We think of this as all working together because really it's about giving you the flexibility and hybrid that your, your business requires. So, and in terms of Azure, what does Azure look like from an anatomy perspective? Well, Azure has a cloud infrastructure, then it has a portal, and it has IaaS and PaaS services running on top of that, running Windows Server and Linux on top. And yes, that is Linux on top. Let me be super clear here. We want to run everything. We want to run anything. You want to use .NET, you want to use Ruby, Python, PHP, whatever it is. We want to make sure it works great and it works super, super awesome. We are a software company. That is what we do. That is our DNA. We're going to make it all work great. Well, today we have delivering on-premises with the Azure Pack and System Center and Windows Server. And what we've been hearing about from our customers and from our service providers is folks love the Azure Pack. They're like, we love the fact that it's got a portal that, that, that's based on it's, it's, it's Azure's portal. We love the fact that it provides a consistent experience. And we want more of that. Give us more Azure on-premises. In fact, if you could actually give us Azure on-premises, that's what we really, really like. Keep going in that direction. 
And so we've heard people loud and clear, and that's exactly what we're doing. In this next wave, we're moving to a new product called Microsoft Azure Stack. And pardon me that the, the products sound very similar, Azure Pack and Azure Stack, but Azure Stack is quite different. Azure Stack is literally bringing Azure to your data center, okay? Whereas it's literally the same APIs. We're bringing capabilities that we've had up in Azure and bringing those on-premises. Some huge advancements we've made in storage, for example. And so now, the most important thing goes back to the application and the application innovation. Because what it means is you can write an application, a single cloud app that runs on-premises in Azure Stack, or it can run in Microsoft Azure, or in a service provider running Azure Stack. It's literally the same cloud application. Now, what do I mean by that cloud application? Well, let me show you. Um, just a few weeks ago, we announced this for the very first time at Ignite, and I demonstrated this for the first time in the keynote. So what does a cloud application look like? Well, here's an example. Here's a cloud application that we deployed in Azure. And you can see that this application isn't just like a web app. It actually consists of IaaS VMs. It consists of PaaS database, PaaS storage, tables, queues, blobs, virtual networks, virtual IP addresses, all of these things that we run today. And this is all running in Azure. This is a new Azure cloud app. And it's based on the new Azure resource model. We then took, and you, by the way, you can see up here, I highlighted it, you can see that it's running in Azure Data Center, because that's an Azure Data Center HD, uh, URL. We then took the same exact application. Here it is running on Azure Stack in your data center. Here is the same exact application. No single code change at all. This is huge. This means you can write one application, again, it's using IaaS VMs, it's using PaaS services, PaaS database, PaaS, it's using tables, queues, blobs. I literally took an application and deployed it in a different place. And in fact, all I did was I used four lines of PowerShell to deploy the application. And the four lines of PowerShell is exactly the same whether I'm deploying it to an Azure data center or an Azure stack data center. Well, I take that back, there's one difference. The one difference was the location variable. In the location variable, instead of me taking, pointing it to an Azure data center, I pointed it, pointed it to an Azure Stack data center, and I deployed the application. But what this means is now you can literally write an application, a cloud application that's elastic, that can grow, that can scale in, that can scale out on the fly, that uses IaaS services, PaaS services, deploy it once, and it runs in Azure or an Azure Stack on your premises. Now, one of the questions we get asked all about all the time is storage. I mentioned this earlier. People will go up to Azure and they see, wow, I can get storage. I can get gigabytes of storage for a fraction of a penny. I, I want storage for gigabytes at a fraction of a penny. I'd like that same storage in my data center. And I always get the question, Jeff, what SAN is that? Well, it isn't a SAN. SANs can't do that. SANs don't meet the scalability, the resiliency, and certainly the cost requirements we need to run a public cloud. No public cloud provider is using a SAN up there. How are we doing it? We're doing it with software-defined storage. With software-defined storage, that's how we've been doing storage since day one. And in fact, the next question I always get is, great, can I have that to run on-premises as well? And the answer is, absolutely yes. We've been delivering this, going back a couple releases, way back to Windows Server 2012, and this is an R2, of course, with our scale-out file server and our software-defined storage. With software-defined storage, you get a fault tolerant storage solution. Not a high available one, a fault tolerant. And there's a big difference between the two. Highly available storage means your application has to have logic in it to understand, oh, I tried to write, but there was a problem with it, and it needs to be resilient to that. Fault tolerant means the storage understands that there's, a, there's, there's issues taking place, and it's transparent to the application. So this is fault tolerant storage, but it's using mainstream storage. It's using SATA disks. It's using SSD, okay? We are changing storage. If you look at storage, what's happening in the industry right now, storage is undergo undergoing a huge transition because storage for the last 20, 30 years has always been on the premises that you buy these enterprise solutions, and okay? And these disks, quote unquote, these enterprise disks never fail, except they do. Software-defined storage is about turning the architecture upside down and saying, we assume the storage is going to fail. We assume the disk is going to fail. 
We assume the network controller, the storage controller, the power supply, the processor, we assume a whole node is going to go down, a disk is going to go down, an enclosure is going to, we assume any of it's going to go down, and that's fine. Because it's already been replicated to another place, it's already been replicated to another location, so if a disk goes down, a storage uh, enclosure goes down, it's okay. Because it's already in a couple of other places. That's what software-defined storage is all about. Now, we've del been delivering this since 2012 and 2012 R2, and our customers love it. But one of the questions we've been asked is they say, you know what, this is really great, but today our solution requires serial attached SCSI, or SAS. And people say, you know what, SAS has its own inherent limitations in and of itself. You can go up to a few dozen, even a few hundred disks before SAS starts to run into its own limitations. Can you make that even easier? So we said, you know what, you're totally right. Let's make that even easier. So in the 2016 wave, we are delivering even more on our, our scale-out storage. This is called Storage Spaces Direct. And here's really simple how to think about it. Can you take a server, can you put a bunch of disks, uh, plug a bunch of disks into it, and then can you plug it into your Ethernet network? If you can do that, I just gave you more storage. Do you need more storage? Take another server, put a whole bunch of disks into it, plug it into your Ethernet network. You have more storage. Would you like some more? Take another server. It's that simple, okay? With storage spaces direct, we've removed serial attached SCSI completely. Ethernet is now the backbone. And this is, again, another area where Cisco and Microsoft couldn't be more aligned. When we look at what's going on in the industry, Ethernet has got a runway for as far as the eye can see. Look at what's shipping today. When you buy a server today, what do you see on the back? Two 10 gig NICs. Well, 40 gig is here as well. And in fact, at Ignite, just a few weeks ago, we demonstrated for the first time Storage Spaces Direct using 100 gigabit Ethernet. The performance was mind-blowing. Torched anything based on fiber channel. Anything. 100 gigabit Ethernet. We were pushing line rate, 12 gigabytes per second. Unbelievably fast performance. But that's not even the end of the story. Like I said, 210s is standard today, 40 gig is shipping today, 100 gig is coming down the pike, and as an industry, we're all talking about how do we get to terabit ethernet. That's why we're making all of these investments together with Cisco today and ethernet, because the writing's on the wall. Ethernet is the protocol to go with. It is the way to do it. And we're gonna continue that. And Storage Spaces Direct is all about that. Number one, it's fault tolerant. Plug in all your disk, if a server goes down, who cares? because it's already been replicated to other places. It's super fast. Um, from use cases, we'll use it for Hyper-V infrastructure, uh, infrastructure as a service. It's great for backup, it's great for replication. And by the way, in case you're wondering, hey, does this work in a hyper-converged environment? Yes. Hyper-converged, by the way, anybody, anybody interested in hyper-converged? Anybody looking at hyper-converged? Yes, no, a few of you. Hyper-converged is the buzzword du jour. That's all anybody wants to talk about. If you want to get, you want to get clicks on your website, just type in hyperconverged and everybody will go to your site. What is hyperconverged? Let's get past the buzz. Hyperconverged is real simple. It means I'm running my hypervisor and I'm running storage on the same node. That's all it means. Most overhyped term in a long, long time. Big deal. Well, guess what? If you want to run hyperconverged, you can run hyperconverged with storage spaces direct and Hyper-V. We'll do exactly that. And that's fine if you want to do small to medium-sized deployments. You want to do four nodes, eight nodes, 12 nodes, 16, 24, maybe 32, go for it. When you get beyond that, when you start wanting to run larger scale, hundreds of nodes, you're going to want a disaggregated approach where you've got separate nodes for compute and separate nodes for storage. And the reason why is really, really simple. Because you want to be able to scale these independently. In a hyper-converged environment, in a small environment, it's no problem plugging in another node. But when you get to hundreds of nodes, you may have things that are really compute heavy and not very storage heavy, or vice versa. And you want to be able to scale those up independently. So we'll support both of those um, in 2016. Another thing I want to point out around hybrid and the importance of networking is what we've been doing around backup and disaster recovery. Over the last few releases, we've made a huge investment in disaster recovery because we've seen that historically, it's an area that customers have wanted to do more in, but it's been too complex and it's been too expensive. 
So we have put a whole bunch of engineering in making it easier to use and reducing the cost dramatically. For example, Hyper-V offers its own built-in replication with Hyper-V Replica. One of the things we did to make it really easy was for management, it's all done through Azure Site Recovery. So with Azure Site Recovery, I don't need to install any disaster recovery software. I simply go up to Azure and I can do this on any device, on a Mac, on a PC, on your phone, on your iPad, on your tablet, on your Surface, because this is all rendered in HTML5. I can create my orchestration, I can create my runbooks, I can create my whole business continuity, uh, disaster recovery and, work and, and, and runbooks, all of that running in Azure. The replication still occurs between my sites, just to be very clear. It does not go up to Azure and come back down. That would be crazy use, waste of resources. That is just managing and orchestrating the process. The replication still occurs between your data centers. At the same time, we've also made this available for VMware and physical. We delivered this for Hyper-V and all the VMware guys got jealous and they said, well, we want that too. So we said, no problem. And you can do that as well for VMware and physical. Now, this is good if you already have a secondary data center. Or if you're planning on buying that secondary data center and you want to do that, then go right ahead. There are plenty of folks that we've talked to that said, you know what, I don't have a secondary data center. I don't want to spend tens of millions of dollars to buy a secondary data center. Can you come up with a different solution? So we did exactly that. If you want to do replication or backup directly up into Azure, you can go right ahead and do that. So we become your secondary backup target. In fact, I've talked to customers that said they have a secondary data center and they want to get rid of that thing. Because basically they're like, this thing is a sunk cost to us and it, the, the, the maintenance and ongoing cost for this, we can't justify it for the amount of times we've ever actually had to use it. So what we'd like to be able to use is, is actually use Azure and sell off and get rid of that secondary data center. So you can do that as well. And then finally, of course, again, the VMware folks got jealous again. And so for physical and for VMware, we're also doing replication directly up into Azure as well. So think about what you're getting here. From a business continuity and disaster recovery standpoint, I now have one console that I can use to manage all my DR. Whether it's Hyper-V, whether it's VMware, where it's physical, it's all happening up in Azure. It's all being orchestrated and automated through Azure through one pane of glass. And again, because it's there as a service, you don't need to install anything on premises or on your machine. And again, you can manage this from your laptop. So this is an application discussion. And so I know we spent a lot of time talking about application development. And so we had to talk about this. It's probably one of the hottest technologies around. Anybody heard about this thing called containers? Anybody heard about containers? Yes? Anybody using containers right now? Not really. OK, this is usually what I see. A lot of people have heard about it. Not so many people using them. All right, containers. Ooh, like hyperconverged, big buzzy talk. What is a container? Why do I care about a container? Um, a lot of things I hear about containers. Um, these will kill VMs, and con containers are going to kill VMs. No, it's not going to happen. Um, I've been working on hypervisors for over 17 years. Hypervisors are going to be around a long time after I retire. Hypervisors and containers work well together, and they will work together, and they will play together. One is not killing the other. The way you want to think about a, a hypervisor versus a container is this. you got a toolbox in your garage. Your toolbox has a crescent wrench, but you also have socketed wrenches. You also have hammers. You have flathead. You've got torques. Guess what? Each one of them has a, a utility, a need. A container and a virtual machine are just like that. There are places where a container is going to make a lot of sense. There are places where a virtual machine is going to continue to make a lot of sense. And there are places where you're going to run both. Absolutely. That's the way. Don't get into the either or. That's the wrong way to think about it. So why containers? Well, before we even get into what a container is, let me briefly explain this problem to you. How many here are developers? Anybody here a developer? OK, a few of you. How many of you guys are in IT? You're IT pros? And OK, OK, so I see that as well. All right. I'm not going to point any fingers, but this may sound familiar to some of you. Developer writes his application on his laptop, works perfectly, runs it again, works perfectly, runs all of his unit tests, works perfectly. He hands it to IT. IT says, yep, I got your application. He deploys it. He goes to deploy it and goes to run it. Doesn't work. I'm sure that's never happened. I'm sure that's never happened to anybody here. But developer hands it off to IT, and IT goes and runs the application. Doesn't work. Calls the developer. Developer's now furious. What do you mean? 
When it left my laptop, it worked perfectly. What do you mean it doesn't work on your server? Your server's broken. He now sends an email to the IT manager's boss saying, you guys don't know what you're doing. I sent you a perfectly working application, doesn't work. So the developer is now screaming at the IT pro. The boss is now screaming at the IT pro. And the IT guy's going, look, I just wanted to deploy an application. So the developer now tells the IT pro, give me admin rights to the server. Guess what? He now logs into the server. Oh, well, it's missing this framework. It's missing these. I need these extra tools. I need this. I need this. And boom, 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 boom. He logs back out and he says, oh, it now works. IT now logs back into the server. Doesn't look like any other server in his infrastructure at all whatsoever. It's got all this custom stuff on it that the developer put on it to fix the app. I see, I see some head shaking. So unfortunately, there's some friction going on here between dev and IT. And it's not that one is right versus one is wrong. It's just that there's differences here. Containers are about solving this problem. Containers, here's how you think about it. Developer writes his application. He puts his framework, his executables, his shared libraries, everything he needs to put in this container. He takes his container, hands the container to IT. IT goes, here's the container. He launches the container and runs the application. And it works every single time. IT is thrilled. Development, thrilled. IT manager, not getting yelling phone calls and emails from developers. Everybody's happy. This is what a container is about. Now, container sounds like magic, doesn't it? Well, let me explain what a container is. First of all, how is a container different from a virtual machine? Well, with a virtual machine, we actually create a virtual piece of hardware in software. We create a virtual motherboard with virtual processors, virtual NICs, virtual storage devices, virtual controllers, okay? There's memory inside these things, and we fire that up, and you can run whatever operating system you want. You want to run Windows? Great. You want to run Linux? Great. You want to run whatever? Great. Runs right on Hyper-V. You can do it right now. Let's get started. A container is totally different. A container runs on the metal. A container actually is running the OS below it. So when you fire up a container, there's no virtualized hardware. It actually sees what's running below it. It shares the kernel, okay? Which means it runs really, really fast. But there's some pros and cons to this. The pros to virtualization means I can run Red Hat Linux, Windows Server 2008 R2, Windows Server 2012 R2, Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 8, all in virtual machines, all on the same server. On a container means when I fire up that container, it's running Windows Server 2016, the next container is running Windows Server 2016, the next container is running Windows Server 2016 ad nauseum. They are all running the same OS below it because they are sharing that common kernel. So what a container does is shares that kernel so that I can run and deploy applications very quickly. It works every time because it's packaged in these container packages and you deploy these. All right, and I'm running out of time so I'm gonna zip through this. So why does everybody care about it? Because it means developers can deploy applications faster and to IT pros, they just launch it, they just run the package and it works. What this means is agility for app owners and it means consistency for IT. What it means IT can do now is focus on the things that it should be doing. Who has permissions? Who, has, who can manage the actual application? Do the right people have the permissions to actually get in there and take advantage of that application? And they can do the things that are important for compliance reasons, for regulatory reasons, for uh, management reasons, while the developers focus on making sure that the application is running bug free. And when he fixes it, he hands them a new container and that's it, done. It's that simple. From an integration standpoint, we've been doing a tremendous amount with our friends over at Docker in the open source community. So if you want to see what Microsoft's been doing with Docker containers, Docker containers, um, we, we've actually been doing it in the open source world. You can go right on up to the, and, uh, to the site and see all of our changes. What we're delivering in the next release of Windows Server is Windows Server containers. And this is the last thing because I've got to get off the stage. But there's the, this is the last thing I want to point out. In Server 2016, we want to make it really easy for developers to deploy applications. So we're including Windows Server containers in the box. It gives me the ability to now create containers on Windows Server and so that I can deliver those applications very, very quickly. The last thing I want to point out is containers, by the way, they're an operating system feature. 
I know that people, in fact, I just did it myself, I called them Docker containers, which is not entirely true. Containers are actually a feature of Linux, and they're a feature of Windows Server. They're an operating system feature. Docker is actually the management layer on top of that, and we're working with Docker very closely so that when we deploy Windows Server containers, you can use all of your Docker tools, and they have the same tools will work to deploy Windows Server containers. So with that, I am out of time. Um, and no, I didn't have any time to talk about Nano Server. I've got to get off the stage. The one last thing I just want to, I just want to leave you with is this. This is the thing I started off with, which is, again, how we think about the cloud. You know, I could, and I, I apologize, I could literally spend the next three days here talking about what we're doing in Windows Server and Cloud and Azure and System Center over the next release, and there's just, just not enough time. I'd barely be scratching the surface. But the most important thing I want to leave you is this, which is as you go forward, as you think about where your company wants to be in the next three years, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, the question you have to ask yourself is, where is it that your company wants to be? Do you want to be in a public cloud? Do you want to be all private cloud? Or most importantly, do you want to be hybrid? Because that's what the vast majority of our customers are telling us. That's what we've been hearing from you. And most importantly, that's where the investments are that Microsoft and Cisco are making together. And making sure that hybrid is the best, best solution for driving your businesses forward. We thank you very, very much and enjoy the rest of the time here at Cisco Life. Jeff Woolsey from Microsoft. Thank you, Jeff.